I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Andrew Price. Welcome to Deep Cuts, the podcast where we pick a topic and walk you through the ins, outs, and nitty gritty so you can appear like an interesting and idiosyncratic person at your next forced social function. Today's topic is... The Stratemeyer signal. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Today's topic is... The Stratemeyer Syndicate. What is the Stratemeyer Syndicate? Well, they were a shadowy collection of writers and editors who were responsible for crafting some of the most iconic and indelible characters in American detective fiction during the 1950s. Characters such as the Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew, the Bobsy Twins, and Tom Swift. Why have you never heard of them? Probably because the company's founder slash resident shady mustache twirling evil business tyrant Edward Stratemeyer never wanted anybody to know about the syndicate. And the only reason why we do know is because a huge lawsuit happened in the 1970s that blew the lid off everything. Edward Stratemeyer. Born on October 1st, 1862, Edward L. Stratemeyer was a writer and publisher most widely known for creating children's fiction. He's responsible for the franchises The Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew, The Rover Boys, The Bobsy Twins, and Tom Swift. Of these, the only ones I had any sort of awareness or personal connection with were The Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew. Like, I don't, I don't think I ever heard of any of these other books that the, the syndicate published. Uh... The only one, I mean, I, I had I had read a couple of the Bobsy Twins books as a kid, but I didn't really like them, mostly because the the versions of the Bobsy Twins that my library had, which is how I came to most of these, were, were like older printings, like from the, you know, the, the, the illustrations in them and the cover art was like from the 20s or 30s. I'm sure the books weren't actually from there. Um, and well, as we'll get into later, everything got si- simultaneously the better and worse versions. Yes, and but because of that, I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't excited as much about it. Um, and I was obsessed with Tom Swift for a while because Tom Swift is the character that inspired Johnny Quest and Terry and the Pirates and a whole bunch of those kind of like kid super scientists characters. Um, so I was really, I was really into him for like five minutes. Although most, I was more specifically, there's, it's two separate franchises. There's Tom Swift and then Tom Swift Jr. And I was really into Tom Swift Jr. And he's the one that's kind of more like, I'm in a flying saucer. Oh yeah. Like that was that in the sixties or the eighties? Sixties. 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 Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. For me, it was, uh, when I was a kid, it was uh, Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew and like the boxcar children. Totally. Those were the ones that I totally knew about, which were. Just available at the library, I guess. Yeah, I was obsessed with Boxcar Children, too. So, you know, Edward Stratemeyer is credited with having written over 1,300 books, which have sold over 500 million copies. Uh, You know what always jumps out to me about these book numbers? Hmm. And maybe it's just because I'm unfairly equating them with box office numbers and television numbers. But, like, when they talk about, like, books sold, the number always sounds very low to me. Hmm. Like, when they're like... A, a book that's been around since like the 1800s and it's like over 1 million copies sold. <laughs> I always, I'm just like yeah, yeah. only a million. Like that seems low. Yeah. I wonder if that's just cause America doesn't read. I don't know. I never had thought about that. That's interesting. Yeah. The number always sounds low to me. <laughs> like with the number of books that are in these series. Yeah. 500 million copies does not just doesn't sound like that well, much. Well, cuz especially me. just Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys alone. There's like 50 volumes together of them, right? Yeah. If not more. No, cuz there's there's probably 100 between the two of them and not counting reboots and remakes and all that stuff. And so for Yeah, that's a good point. Huh. Well, and especially when you think about 13,000 books. Like think about how many millions of books Harry Potter has sold. And not that necessarily Harry Potter and uh, Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew are, you know, equatable in terms of cultural impact. Although maybe they are, actually, now that I'm saying that. I don't know. Well, I mean, they're equatable in terms of cultural impact, but their impacts sort of happen at different times. So yeah. Harry Potter hit in a very, in a in a time where, you know, con- consumerism and consumption around yeah 
pop culture like zeitgeist was in full swing. Yeah. Whereas, you know, uh, the heyday of, of the Hardy Boys was in a time where things were a little bit more conservative on that front. Growing up, uh, Ed Stratemeyer, old Dirty Eddie, he was obsessed with reading and in specific was a massive fan of dime store novels. And his hero was a dude named Horatio Algier Jr. Uh, in 1890, Stratemeyer moved to Newark, New Jersey and opened a paper store. Uh, from there, he started uh, writing novels and short stories. And when I found out that he ordered a, or started a paper store, I kind of imagine that as being like a wholesaler, you know, like he's not actually writing for any publisher. He's just kind of like, ah, look at all. This is my Reeves BFK Cool Press. Yep. You want, you Michael want, Scott's paper company? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Like, it, you know, just a really shitty version of Michael Scott, um, but obsessed with like dime store novels in the 1800s. Do you think that he ever had aspirations of, do you think that it was ever about the writing for him? And then it's, he sort of just hide overtook Jekyll after a certain amount of time? Or do you think he always was just like, how can I turn this into a business? I don't think so. I, th- I mean, I th- well, I think there's two parts to that. One, life in the 1800s is a lot different than it is now. And specifically on the turn of the century and specifically, you know, towards the end of his life in the, you know, 20s and 30s. Like, I think life is hard. And when you see an, a me versus somebody else thing, nine times out of 10, most people choose me. And I think he kind of did that and to, to in an escalating scale. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't think you, he wrote a shitload of books, not all of which he even got credit for. Like, I think this person was obsessed with the written word and really liked writing and liked reading and liked the art form, but also rent waits for no man, you know? Yeah. Also, the, the crazy thing is when you really, you know, in the, in the scope of the story, like he actually kind of is only a small piece of it. Like, yeah. like this, we'll, we'll get into it later on, but the sum whole of the Stratemeyer syndicate and what it did was kind of more fr- with his daughter. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like she was, the one who kind of just started it. Like yeah. he was kind of just like, here's the thing. And then he set up the, the infrastructure. Yeah. But also at like at one point, I mean, yes, she turned it into a well-oiled ma- machine, but he started, he had like 15 series going at one point, 20 series, which each had multiple tiers of writers and each had different publishers. Like he, it's not like he just was like, oh, maybe I'll try this with just Nancy Drew and Har- the Hardy Boys. There's like 15 other ones that he did that, you know, Trixie Belden, who's like the girl detective who likes horses and then the Rover Boys and like the one, you know, the ones we listed at the beginning of this episode where it's, there's the science fiction one, there's the horror one, there's the alien invasion one. Stratemeyer's first novel was published by Richard Dare's Venture in 1894. Around this time, he was approached by Gilbert Patton, the writer and editor, to become an editor at Good News, which is a magazine that was published by Street and Smith the prolific publishers of pulp magazines, dime store novels, and a bunch of comics. While working at Street and Smith, Stratemeyer met and befriended his idol, Horatio Algier Jr. After working there for a few years, Stratemeyer published The Rover Boys, which was his first kind of foray into this whole, like, kid detective fiction genre. Uh, And that kind of jump-started it all. The detective novel starring two adolescent boys uh, quickly became a series. Horatio Algier passed away around this time with multiple unfinished projects. He asked Stratemeyer to finish them. Stratemeyer would actually go on to write multiple new books under Algier's name as well after, you know, Algier had passed away. And this was kind of the first time that he really... He'd been using pseudonyms to kind of, like, do various projects and short stories with and stuff, but taking over for Horatio and kind of finishing a couple of his series and then writing a couple new books under his name was the first time that that really kind of like sparked the idea in his head. For the Rover Boys, each volume opens with a letter from Stratemeyer extolling the virtues of the characters, the quality of the writing in the books, and slyly advertising other novels in the series. So, you know, basically he was the Stan Lee of the 1800s. And if you want to learn about how legendary Marvel Comics writer, editor, and producer Stan Lee maybe wasn't as great a guy as you thought he was and maybe didn't create all the characters he acted like he did, you should listen to our upcoming episode of Deep Cuts on Stan Lee. Yeah, so Edward Stratemeyer, his book, The Rover Boys, was a massive success. 
Um, it started in 1899 and went till 1926, lasting 30 volumes. He wrote it under the pseudonym Arthur M. Winfield. The other question is, did he actually write it under the pseudonym Arthur M. Winfield? Like, did he have go- double ghost artists? That's the interesting thing about doing all this research is, like, it's really hard to tell which of these books that they're, that are credited to him are actually written by him and which are the ones that just nobody has the cultural memory to figure out if there was another ghost artist or another ghost writer or not. Because the reason that we know, jumping forward a little bit, the reason we know that um, the Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys were written by the syndicate is because there was a big lawsuit, you know, later in time, which we'll get to. But it's it's really like half of these things that we're attributing to him. I'm like, are they really him, though? I don't really know. Well, from what I read, because of the nature of the way that was done, it's impossible to know which of any of these books he wrote. Yeah. Um, they can kind of know which ones like some of the bigger ghostwriters wrote because they said, like, I wrote this yeah. after that lawsuit happened. Mm-hmm. But he was dead by then. So there was nobody to co- to to sort of organize everything and point out which things were written by whom. Ed Stratemeyer was a businessman more than a writer. He quickly realized that if he dealt with multiple publishers under different names, he could sell books and make more money and thus supply the blossoming children's literature market with product. From here, Stratemeyer quickly took on too much work and realized he wasn't going to be able to physically write all of the work that was required of him. So he farmed out the boring and pedantic task of actually writing to ghostwriters. He constructed a system where he would act as a choke point. None of the other writers knew each other or the publishers. He, in all intents and purposes, acted as a middleman, almost an agent or a distributor. Uh, And then he just took all the credit and the money. Except he didn't really take all the credit, but he kind of did. By, I mean, by nature, I mean, I think it says it later on, or maybe it doesn't. uh, Maybe it's just something I, I was reading, but they went to great lengths to, they never wanted anyone to know that this was a thing. Yeah. He wanted people to think that, those people were real people. Yeah. And there's a bunch of, like, I remember seeing the photo of Franklin W. Dixon on the back of a bunch of the Hardy Boys books that I read as a kid. And now I'm just, like, fascinated by who was that guy. Like, was he just a dude in the office where they were like, George, come here, George. We're going to put your photo on the back of the book. Yeah. Like it's, well, what I mean, what he really did, because he didn't take the credit. He, yeah. He took the credit. He, yeah, yes. He, he took, uh, it wasn't that he took the credit for himself. He took away the credit. Yeah. He, he, he like re-channeled of, it. Yeah, he yeah. stripped you of your ability to have credit for something. Yeah. Which, which almost is like kind of worse in a, in a way. Because it's like, it's not even like some, it's, it's like when somebody, like when somebody steals credit for something or claims your work, uh, you, you know, you're kind of victimized in a way. You're like, you know, this person has stolen this from me. Yeah. But he sort of like just abolished the idea of authorship in these stories. And there's really, it's, it's kind of fascinating though. Yeah. Like, like, I mean, I've, I've had thoughts. You about can't be mad at a fictional person. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like the, the fake name that, that it says wrote your book. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. Uh, so the, the downside of this though, is that all the Stratemeyer syndicate books, they, kind of feel similar they all kind of have a similar formula they're all murder mysteries they all have you know children that are above average intelligence going on a mystery adults are always wrong they're always kind of like seeing things that aren't there people say they're crazy and then they're not you could if you changed the names on almost all the franchises they would kind of be the same um which is interesting because it since even though they were written by so many different people (coughs) the formula and the under the like understructure of all of these stories is so similar and so um, well trodden that it, it kind of like removes authenticity and individuality inherently, which is really fascinating too on another level, you know, where like not only is, is your author subscript, but your ability to assert yourself in this little three act structure is also squashed. Yeah. I mean, at that point, you're just a tool or like a. Mm-hmm. A data entry person. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, The most prolific ghostwriters that worked for the syndicate were Josephine Lawrence, Howard R. Garris, and Leslie McFarlane. Initially, the writers would write off of plots supplied by Stratemeyer, and then they would uh, quickly be given a summary, and then they would turn a book in in about a month or so. 
I don't want, I want to unpack the subject matter of these books and the repetitive structure of them. So these books, they're all about kids who are detectives, who the adults around them kind of like can't figure something out or they don't believe them when they're right about something. And then in the end, they're validated. And that's just what these books are all about. And I, and that's what made these books tap into the zeitgeist at the time and become massively popular uh, because he filled a section of the market that just was being underserved. And, uh, you know, as we'll discuss more later, you know, the books are sort of wish fulfillment power fantasies for kids that age. And maybe it was purely from a business perspective of he just realized that that was exactly the market he needed to grab. But, you know, to the degree that, you know, he may have started off, and that's why I kind of asked earlier, like, was this always just a business thing? Or did he start out with like aspirations of wanting to write? You know, if, if he did have those aspirations, you know, what was what was the motivation for him? I, I know why they appealed to me as a kid. But what appealed to him about writing this specific type of story to the point where all the books are kind of the same? Yeah. And it's not just like, oh, and then there are 10 books in a series. No, there's like seven or eight series, each with 50 or 60 books in them. So like he's repeatedly going over this, which goes back to the iterative design thing that I was telling you about, like, or mentioning you earlier of like, I love, I love franchises that have an iterative quality to them. Like, you know, there are some people who are really interested in Oh, the first Texas Chainsaw is the best. Oh, the first Predator is the best. Oh, the first whatever is the best because it's the initial debut of that idea. It's the first crystallization of all of these forces of chaos coming together and turning into a thing that is unique and different. But what's interesting to me, you know, as a writer, is that I really like when things have been going for far too long, the ideas are old. And you have to kind of like remix and recombine things. Like one of my favorite humans of all time is Shotaro Ishinomori, the guy who created Kamen Rider and Super Sentai and Detective K and all of Cyborg 009, Inazuman. And all of those characters are basically the same character. He was obsessed by a tragedy that befalls somebody and then they get turned into a robot. And then that robot has to go up against a religious cult, governmental organization, or group of bad people that have a similar robotic enhancement. Every one of his stories is that thing. And I think part of that is he was a craftsman journeyman type guy who got put into the role of an auteur because he was Osamu Tezuka's assistant, basically. He kind of got anointed when maybe he didn't really... He was a workhorse. He, he, I think he still holds the world record for the most number of pages drawn, similar to Stratemeyer. He didn't actually draw all those pages. He had fucking assistants draw all those pages because manga doesn't work like people think it works or something. I, it's like open knowledge that mangaka don't actually draw the pages. They do like thumbnails and then they'll draw some faces. And then there's a motorcycle guy and a guy who renders grass and a dude who draws window panes. And, you know, I really love watching somebody's kind of mental state arc you know what i mean of like that i love the idea that somebody just does a volume of manga and it just happens to there's no houses in the whole thing and it takes out it takes place in a jungle and the window pane guy is like fuck (laughs) yeah how am i gonna explain this to my wife (laughs) yeah exactly um but I, I just, I'm, I'm so interested with that iterative design functionality. I'm so interested about, like, looking at, you know, season 15 of a TV show. Or, you know, it, it's really prevalent in Japanese live action shows where you have Kamen Rider, Super Sentai, Ultraman, Godzilla, any of these long running franchises, but specifically the more toyotic, toyetic and children's TV shows, how they reboot every year. So you have a new Kamen Rider or a new Super Sentai team or a new Ultraman every year and they have to come up with new gimmicks and they have to come up with new ways to keep people excited. New costumes, new... This time you get to collect trading cards or whatever it is. I love that aspect of long-form serialized narratives. And it's fascinating to see that in 
the Nancy Drew Hardy Boys boy detective, girl detective, teen adventurer genre, that doesn't really exist. You're never really, in air quotes, reinventing the form. You're usually just doing the same thing again and again and again. And there is no real attempt at letting the characters grow or age or do something different. Or this time, Nancy Drew is going to have to go up against an a girl who's like the her evil doppelganger. You know what I mean? Like th- those tropes that are existing in long form narratives. The most interesting thing in that vein that I kind of read about was that, like in I forget it was some it was I don't know if it was like early two thousands, maybe it was like twenty twelve or something like that. They did a they like basically ended the. Hardy Boys series that had been running since the 20s for the like the first time ever mm-hmm. and they rebooted it and they did uh, a book series called Hardy Boys Undercover Brothers <laughs> and <laughs> it's the worst it is, title. It's a really terrible title um did I mean they, they, did they did they race swap them is it like a no race I don't thing? think it has anything I think I, I think they were just completely oblivious to the fact that there's that, all like 85 year old people yeah or that, something? that SNL character that yeah. is obviously good people were going to think about when you hear the word undercover brother yeah um but uh um or not SNL character that movie whatever, yeah, movie, whatever yeah, that yeah, was yeah yeah the movie yeah um but um it was the the, the biggest change was that number one the brothers were fought sometimes because apparently they never fought in the entire history of the series they always got along and never had like sibling quarrels yeah and also it was written in uh first person where every Mm. other chapter was from the perspective of one joe or frank yeah yeah and that was the difference that was the biggest like evolution that sounds terrible (laughs) that sounds so bad yeah yeah it's yeah it's like why would you i don't know i i I don't want to yeah but but like that's but that just goes to prove my point even more though like the their version of mixing it up is doing it in first person yeah. like it's not even like and then they go to outer space it's like we just changed the tense like, what it's so bizarre to me that it doesn't evolve or change or grow and like and and even like in the media adaptations like the 70s nancy drew and hardy boy mystery hour which i love that show i love that show if you haven't seen it uh, basically, every other episode is either a Nancy or a Hardy Boys episode, and it builds a whole cinematic universe. And at the end of the first episode or end of the first season, they cross over and they meet each other. And then season two, they are kind of in each other's spaces a little bit more, but it's usually still every other episode is a mystery that either of them are solving. And it's it's really really cool from a formalist a formalist standpoint. Um, the show is written by or created by Glenn Larson, the guy who created Battlestar Galactica, who is also a crazy fucking Mormon. And um, the show is awesome. Like, it's so cool. The theme song is great, which I'm sure people have heard parodied before and didn't know that it was that song. It's like them, like, walking around in this maze. And the, there's Yeah, the a, intro is really cool. Oh, it's so it's cool. It's really moody. It's awesome. So great. Like, if I ever had a TV show... I would just want to have people walking around in a maze to a weird, somber oboe, bassoon, whatever the fuck that instrument is. Awesome. I fucking loved it. But that but that that show also proves that the characters, for better or for worse, are kind of rigid. And in the show, one of the brothers, I think it's Frank, no, Joe. Joe Hardy um, is played by Sean Cassidy's younger brother. Yeah. And he had a burgeoning musical career at the time. And so in various episodes, Joe Hardy just sings. Like, they just open or close an episode with him, like, playing a gig. And it is so weird. And, and it, like, the rest of the show is f- great. And then all of a sudden you just dip into fucking whatever his name is, Seth. <laughs> it's not Seth, but Cassidy, y- younger Cassidy, Cassidy Jr.'s musical career. And it's so fucking strange. And also it's so funny... That we're having this conversation because in the first half of season one, both Frank and Joe are wearing like 70s clothes, like bell bottoms and like flowy shirts, deep V cuts, you know, almost hippie ish. And then towards the end of the season, you could tell the ratings were dipping and they're like, we got to we got to fucking sort this shit out. And then they start wearing their kind of more iconic 
single colored sweaters, you know, more slim cut pants, which I'm sure in the 70s were considered more square. But the show just kind of aligns itself. It feels better when they are a little bit more conservative in their dress and not as kind of garish because it it just doesn't feel right with those characters. And I don't I don't know why that is. Well, it's weird how kind of particularly back in the 60s and 70s, how sort of like naked they were about like just saying like, oh, what's this other thing like that's really popular right now? Like we're going to do our thing. And even if it's like an established IP, like the Hardy Boys, we're going to make it more like this thing that's popular right now. And I, I've never watched it, but I was reading, you know, even crazier uh, is the there's a Hardy Boys cartoon. I've never seen that. Yeah. What the fuck? And it was a it was before the sh- the 70s show. Mm. But in the cartoon, they're a band. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like it was just so obviously like the 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 partridge family was yeah. a thing yeah and like the brady bunch had their they eventually became a family band and that got like really popular and there was all these band shows like yeah. jabber jaw and josie the, and the hair bear cats. bunch and josie and the pussycats and they were just like we're gonna make the hardy boys but then we're just gonna like slap on an overlay of like the current thing that is popular <laughs> right now which is cartoons about roving bands oh i love it so much see i I, I've, I've never seen that. I've seen the original like forties serials, uh, for the Hardy Boys and the Mickey Mouse Club show. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, and then I've seen the seventies show. Um, and then I've seen, I've only seen one of the forties Nancy Drew movies. There's, I guess there's like three or four. Um, but one of them is like lost. So they, they know that there are four. But it's only lost? Th- yeah, ex- I know, right? I know. You don't even know. <laughs> and then it just cuts to you and me in a maze with magnifying glasses. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have definitely fantasized about trying to track that down. The other, the other lost movie replica prop thing that I've always had like the fantasy of like maybe one day I'll find it. Maybe I'll have maybe I'll just have a shitload of money and I'll just hire a private investigator to find this thing. Is the Dark Shadows Barnabas Collins portrait from season one, the like painting that they show in every episode of him as a vampire. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows where it is. Mm-hmm. Ooh, spooky. It could happen. They had that that there was that urban legend for decades about how they buried all those E. T. Atari games yeah. out in the desert in New Mexico. And then somebody just actually found it one day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Going back to, you know, the the tropes for the Hardy Boys and all the rest of these kind of novels. Uh, Hardy Boys and Nancy Nancy Drew had very similar setups. Fenton Hardy, the boy's father, is a detective. Their mother is no longer in the picture. They solve mysteries because the adults are always up to no good. They're always discovering some random person that has nefarious intent. Nobody believes them, and then they go out and prove that this person has nefarious intent. Nancy Drew, her father, Carson Drew, is also a detective. Nancy's mother isn't in the picture. Uh, Since she doesn't have a brother to go on adventures with, she has a couple friends. Ned the nerdy reader stand-in that's sort of her love interest. Um, But not really. It's mostly he's the person who pines after her, almost kind of like if a male reader is reading Nancy Drew, they're supposed to identify with Ned. Uh, And then George, who's the plucky best friend, where if you're a girl reading Nancy Drew, you probably identify with George. Um, I wonder why... I, I wonder why the choice was made because they made the Hardy Boys and then he basically was like, we need to make a girl version of this. And I wonder what the the reason for the choice of just making her by herself as opposed to two kids was because it's, it's funny because when I was a kid, I actually gravitated more towards Nancy drew because I liked the dynamic of just one person kind of solving mysteries, Mm -hmm. very similar to like noir films, Mm -hmm. just the solitary person. And I was less, I was, I was more interested in that dynamic than two people solving something together. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I don't think I was just, I I think I just was not as familiar with that dynamic because I was kind of 
like a very isolated kid. So I, I was almost like put off by that of like, you know, I, I don't relate to hanging out with somebody and having this dynamic. And then later on, I almost kind of did a 180 where maybe, you know, to, you know, as I've gotten older into my adult life to want to fill that hole of the isolation that I had as a kid. Now I'm, now I gravitate towards stories about like friendships and brothers and sisters and things of two people like bonding yeah. um, that aren't like romantic relationships. Uh, so now I'm like more interested. In, I, I'm, I gravitate more towards the Hardy Boys dynamic than the Nancy Drew. But when I was a kid, it was the opposite. Yeah, as a kid, I, I loved both of them, honestly. I really, the thing I liked about the Hardy Boys as a kid is that they, it's, um, it's funny because it's a similar thing to what you're describing where it's kind of like, oh, but it's two people. I don't really relate to that. The thing I liked about that is that because I had siblings and we kind of went everywhere together and did everything together to the degree to which I was almost kind of like, I wish I could be by my fucking self. Um, <coughs> I really liked that or not. I don't even know if I put it in these words as a child, but like I related to the fact that Joe and Frank Hardy did everything all the time together. Yeah. I related to the fact that they were this weird little unit Um and it's funny listening to you talk about Nancy Drew because that was like 100% my Nancy Drew experience where I was just like the, I, I related so much to like the individual knowing that things are wrong. Like I I mean it's it's obviously they knew what they were doing. They were marketing to me. They were 100% trying to feed into that little thing in the corner of my brain. But like 100% that was I related to that so much. Especially because, like, as a kid, I was a pretty verbal and mature kid. Like, my mom would always joke that she could, like, you know, leave me alone and come back into the room and I'd be talking to the wall. You know, like, I, I could make friends with anybody. And that probably spiraled out into me being friends with people that are older, consistently having adults in my life that were not necessarily familial relationships, but just older people that I knew because... Like we would be literally be like sitting at the bus stop or something and I just start talking to the person next to me and then those connections spiral over time and whatnot. But as a kid, you're treated a specific way. And I was always very frustrated by that. I was always very like, yes, I understand that technically I am younger than you and you probably know some things I don't know, but that doesn't mean that my experience is invalid. Um, and Nancy Drew was the perfect synthesis of that for me, you know, where it was this kind of like, I know that inside that ticking clock, there's a secret hallway that goes to a weird underground cavern and there's a murder happening down there. Like, I know it. You yeah, know? And it's, the, it's the power fantasy for that because, in, you know, she she definitively proves that she's right to All these the people. All the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also not in a goofy way. Like, there's something about the way that that is executed where I obviously I liked Scooby-Doo as a kid. And it's the same kind of power fantasy, right? But the kids are a little bit older and it's like, oh, this, you know, otherworldly thing. Pull the mask off. It's not actually a Yeti. It's Mr. Squabbadoo. And like. Love that episode. Right. Yeah. Mr. Squabbadoo's revenge. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, and I liked that as a kid, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't ring as true to me as, as the Nancy Drew conclusions where she's, you know, it's her and George or her and Ned or the three of them and. She's like, this is the way it is. And nobody believes her up until the last page. And then she's like, look, I was right. And everyone's like, oh, Nancy, you were right. Also, I had, I just had a big crush on the way that Rudy Nappy painted those covers. I loved, I love, I wanted to look like her as a kid. I wanted to have the bob. I wanted to have the weird yellow sweater. I wanted to be her so badly. And that probably explains a lot about me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think you've done it. Mm, Touche. I'm like Nancy Drew, but make it mall goth. Yeah. <laughs> Ex-hardcore kid Nancy Drew. Um, uh, so the Hardy Boys <laughs> is credited to Franklin W. Dixon, as we've previously stated. Obviously, a pseudonym. Uh, while there are many writers that took over the books, uh, one who is most widely thought of as creating the large amount of the novels and is considered the Hardy Boys ghostwriter-in-chief is a dude named Leslie McFarlane. He wrote 19 out of the initial 25 Hardy Boy novels. Uh, the thing that I love about this guy, and there's some problems that I think we'll talk about in a second, but putting casting those aside. Uh, problems it, with him as a person? or Problems, just the, the racism stuff. In oh, the books, yes, Which absolutely. obviously he yes. was sort of 
yes. a big part of that. Yep. Um, but aside from that, uh, I just love in doing research and reading about him. I love the fact that like in the early books he wrote, he was basically like he made the Hardy Boys less rich. Yeah. And and he was basically like fuck cops and fuck, <laughs> all the time. And fuck rich people. Yeah, fuck cops. To a cab, a cab, and people with money suck. Yeah, to the point where they had to be like, you need to start respecting authority more. And they and he, like they made him dial it back because mm-hmm. his early books were just like two like punk kids, like in both senses of the words, just being like fuck you, cops. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Fuck you, rich, uh, greedy, fat cats. <laughs> it's yeah. like just punk rock Hardy Boys. I just, I just love, I love that. I, I had no sense of that whenever I was well, a but kid. You, you wouldn't have. Because Cause they changed them. Yes, yeah. they changed them. That's another thing I want to talk about is like, the way that they describe it in here, it's like the originals, other than the racism stuff, the original ones were way better. And I'm like, which ones did I read? They must have been the sanitized yeah, versions. Yeah. Yeah, the the what's her name, uh, Catherine Stadermeyer Adams, something, whatever. We'll get yeah. there. We'll get there. It's in here. It's in here. <coughs> Nancy Drew is credited to Carolyn Keene. Um, Stadermeyer hired Mildred Wirt Benson to write the majority of the early Drew series. Um, she wrote volumes one through seven, and then eleven through twenty five. Uh, Walter Karen was brought in to write eight, nine, and ten. Obviously, many other people worked on the later volumes. Um, she's awesome though. Mildred Ward Benson is the shit. Yeah. I don't know if you looked at photos of her, but she looks like the coolest person. She, uh, she looks kind of like a a Pixar movie version of your grandma where you're like, oh man, you're so cool. Uh, you've got this like little Bob. Oh yeah. You live to be like a hundred years old. This is fucking rad. Yep. Um, you know, it was funny while doing all this research for this episode, like some of this I knew and some of it I obviously didn't, um, and I, the whole time was just like, oh man, if we just had done this 10 years ago, most of these people would have still been alive, <laughs> you know? I mean, they would have been old as fuck, but they would have still been alive. Could have gotten old wordy on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Old o, uh, ODW. Yep. <laughs> old Dirty Wirt. The discussion of ghost writers, how many sports stars and political figures use uh, ghost writers to write their novels. Drake uses ghost writers. Um you know, is is that morally or is is there a moral clause on that? Is that something that is I don't know. I mean, I want to ask you about that because my question is, you know, to you is is there an ethical way of doing this? Because you know, we're talking about we're talking about the di- difference between somebody who um, writes books and whether they're doing it primarily for money or they're doing it as a passion and making a living off of it as a supplementary thing. Um, Somebody who's fine with making the amount of money that you make from being an author who puts out even a book a year, if you're like Stephen King level of prolific, um, versus somebody who saw a bigger bigger, uh, grift in building a syndicate where you could be cranking out multiple multiple books a month mm-hmm. and turning it into an empire. And the way that it was done uh, has its issues. But, you know, is there is there a it was there is there any kind of ethical way of doing what he did? Because, you know, I was thinking about it and it's like, OK, so let's say that instead of this, he did the same thing. Ghostwriters, they were still under these pseudonyms. Uh, but he gave the authors royalties for what they did. But then like that almost goes into like IP farming territory of like, like I, I, I'm, I'm curious of your opinion on this. On yeah, this. I think, I think for me, the main, I, th- it's really interesting. Like from a, from a authorial, almost kind of like performance art standpoint, I'm, I'm re- I love the idea of a bunch of people agreeing to make a fake persona to all channel their creativity through to kind of like shore up their creative potential and then buckshot it out. I really love that idea. I love the idea of building a persona for this person. I wish that 
they had done fake interviews with Franklin W. Dixon, and there was an actor to hi- that was hired to play Franklin W. Dixon in publicity experience, uh, pu- publicity appearances. I think that idea. If they were, if they were doing it for the the performance of it, rather than be, just for the yeah, like I would be so aspect. into that. Like Lemony Snicket is a perfect example. Like Lemony Snicket isn't a real fucking person. Yeah, I think it's two people, three people. I don't, I don't know the specifics of it, but I know that there's an, an illustrator and a writer at, at the very least, if not multiple writers. Have you read the theory about how people think that Andrew W.K. is not one guy? It's a syndicate of impersonators? I don't know if you're joking right now. That's, real, that's a real thing. I would love that. I would love that. There's a, there's, a, there's a belief, and there's a whole Wikipedia page about it, that people think that there's like... Andrew W.K. is a like performance art fictional character and there's a bunch of people that play him and they play him for different reasons. And the idea is to like some, one, one, one guy plays him as a musician when, whenever he records music and performs live. There's, that's one guy. And then one guy is like his like spoken word person that's like a poet. And then one guy is like a painter and that's why, you know, Andrew W.K. does all these different types of things. And he's like a multimedia artist because it's actually like a collective of people playing a character I called love Andrew that idea. W.K. I love that idea. I mean, I've even thought about this. You know, the, the book I'm working on right now is like not necessarily about Edward Stratemeyer, but there's like a girl adventurer character. And there's this metatextual element of like a character that is named the same name as me who is obsessed with my creative output, yada, yada, yada. Maybe he tries to do some things to subvert my legacy, yada, yada, yada. Um, and I've been really obsessed with, like, how would you do, how would you adapt that idea? Like, if you were going to make a TV show, it would be really weird if every credit on the show was this character's name. And then you stage a fight where... I get removed from the show and then it's in air quotes revealed that there was a syndicate behind the show and that all of these names were just complete bullshit. Like I love that idea of like almost kind of kayfabe, you know? Yeah. I really love (coughs) stuff like that. The issue being that honestly, the Stratemeyer syndicate, I would be fine with it. It would just kind of be like a novelty if the people that did the work shared in the uplift at all. Even if they got minor royalties, but they got like $128 a book. Or no, sorry, $125. I'm looking at it in the outline. $125 a book. That, yeah. that sucks. Yeah, especially even if that was more money back then than it is now. Of course. I mean, back then o- it's probably a, what, over, a couple grand. Over time, the yeah. compound of it. I mean, yeah. I would forego that upfront payment for royalties any fucking day of the week. Yeah. Like even if it was a, you got a, Maybe even, even, even if it was only the writers that work on the first 30 volumes get royalties. And then from that point on, everything is established. We know what's happening. You, you, you're just getting a day rate or you know, you're getting your, your per book fee or whatever, you know. The kid who uh, was the singing voice of young Simba in the original Lion King movie, they were basically like, do you want $2 million or do you want royalties from this movie? And he was like, get that $2 million out of my fucking face. <laughs> and now he's fucking rich as hell. Good for him, man. That's great. Not that he wouldn't have been rich as hell with $2 million. million. Yeah. Yeah. But also $2 million doesn't go as far as you think it does. Yeah. For an entire life, you know, um, especially taxes. Whew. Well, now Oof. he's, and he's made all the money off of the new movie now too. Oh, really? Well, cause he, like, he has ro- royalties in that franchise in the so oh oh, oh i didn't know because yeah. i'm none of the i mean that was a big kerfluffle online that none of the none of the writers or directors or people involved in the original land king movie saw any royalties at all for the new in air quotes live action even though it's not live action it's animated but yeah. but yeah he has a he has stake in the franchise so wow good for him man um yeah i feel like if they if i feel like there is a way to do this that is moral the way they did it is not moral. Yeah. Um, Ed, old dirty Ed Stratemeyer passed away in 1930. Uh, he willed the syndicate to his daughters, Harriet Stratemeyer Adams and Edna Stratemeyer. Within a few years, Edna, after getting married, sold her share to Harriet. 
who would be the driving force for the syndicate for the next 40 years. She, uh, she Kevin eastman did. Yeah, she did. In, 19, in the 1950s, Harriet spearheaded remastered editions. They basically updated all the references in the books, the jokes, made them more timeless. And at the behest of the publisher, um, they removed all the racism or racist slurs. Um, she, unfortunately, didn't want to do this. Yeah. She, she didn't see anything wrong she with it. She thought it was unnecessary. Yeah. Um, Which is not, I mean... We'll never know her, her personal thoughts, but it's not necessarily her saying like I like the racism in it. But at, at the very at the very least, she just didn't care and had, saw no issue with it. Yeah, I don't know. That sounds pretty shitty to me. No, I'm saying I'm saying like at the very least, she was sort of complicit in. Yeah, yeah, she, <clears throat> not not so great. Um, to make things weirder, Harriet Stratemeyer Adams Stratemeyer Adams is credited with writing over twenty five Nancy Drew novels. Volumes 33 and then 35 through 58, which is weird because so she's running this ghost ship, basically. She's taking all these people, having them work for really poor wages, not receiving any credit. And you want to paint that picture. You want Emotionally, you want to paint a picture of this person being like holier than thou or in some ways nefarious. But obviously... It's a little bit more nuanced in the similar way to how Ed Stratemeyer was, where she also is very invested in this thing on a deep emotional level and wants it to be good and thinks that she knows what's best for the books to the degree to which she's A, rewriting the early books herself, and B, then just taking over the franchise. And she, like, runs it for, like, 30 years and not runs it like hires other ghostwriters. Like, she physically writes the novels, which is so bizarre to me. Because narratively, if it was a movie, that person doesn't write, that person's kind of a shitty, you know, shitty rich kid. They've taken over daddy's business and then they're just like collecting checks. Yeah. But it's not that. Life is obviously. Yeah. And and that's where it kind of diverges from the Stan Lee thing because it's like this whole thing was not rooted in like, how can I just do the least amount of work possible and make the most amount of money? It was literally just like. I've reached my limit of being able to write these books, so I now need to expand with additional writers. Yeah, which is so bizarre. Um, But then again, it goes back to what I was saying about Ed Stratemeyer of, like, she's credited with those books, but did she actually write those books? I don't know. Everything in here is so smoke and mirrors and plans within plans within plans that you don't... It's very hard. Maybe maybe she wrote all the books. Maybe there wasn't. <laughs> there any is of these no. Other there is no Wirt Benson or whatever the fuck that woman's name is. Everything's just completely maybe fabricated. It was like a weird double, like twice baked, uh, <laughs> uh, big eyes. She's the the Kaiser Soze. Yeah, of, where she was writing these books as a child she, in utero. Yeah. She's writing the books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's really it's really interesting to me. Like it's funny because every in, every, every month her during her gestation period, her mom pooped out a hearty <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> oh God. It's funny to me though, because she's she in this whole story, there's obviously a myriad of very interesting characters, very idiosyncratic idiosyncratic, bizarre people. But she's the most interesting to me. She's you know, this it's, this heir apparent to this massive franchise who could rest on her laurels but chooses not to, but also perpetuates this cycle of fucking people over, but then doesn't and kind of like works in the trenches along with these people and really like shepherds this thing for 40 years. Like that's fascinating. She was also editing and rewriting before her dad died. Yeah, 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 yeah. And also I think she was credited with like Again, who the fuck knows how many of these she actually did, but credited, she was credited with writing something like 200 novels. That's a shitload of typing. Yeah. That's another thing that, you know, that's, I was thinking about through this whole thing is like, I know the amount of time it takes me to write. I know the amount of time that I spend away from loved ones, away from having experiences alone in my apartment typing. All of these people that we're talking about, it's just so many lonely people. Yeah, they're just, yeah, they're just like cranking out fucking book after book. And it's so interesting. Isolated at some roll top desk. Yeah. And it's, it's so interesting to me specifically because 
the theme of all of these books is adults are lying to you. Everyone's lying to you. Don't believe them. Search out the truth for yourself. And every one of these adults are lying to the children. Like it's it's fascinating. The, 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 the dichotomy within a dichotomy, the double helix of, you know, uh, wanting to do the right thing and then not or wanting to take credit for something and not like it's just it's fascinating. The Mobius strip of lonely people. Well, that's why I wonder why Stratemeyer latched onto this specific story archetype. Yeah. Like, why was he so obsessed? Other than just the marketability of it. Yeah, but don't you think there has to be... Why was he so obsessed There has to be some part of him that was upset by this. detectives who no adults believe them, and then they prove them right in the end. Why was he obsessed with that? I don't know, man. I mean, I feel like there has to be a subconscious, deep... There's a thing in your heart that says, my entire business model, my way of being, my legacy isn't just and true. You know what I mean? My... The thing that I have built is an infernal machine and it's fucking over a shitload of people. Yeah. And like, you know, depending on what your opinions might be, that might have been eating him up inside or it might have been him taunting people. I think you could go either way. And you were never going to know because the home, homie died in 1930. Yep. Um, Before they invented journals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Harriet Stratemeyer Adams died in 1982, though. Ironically, while watching the classic children's film, The Wizard of Oz, uh, she died of a heart attack on her first viewing, too, which is in multiple articles I read about her. They always say the first time she was watching Wizard of Oz, she died, which is such a weird, specific detail. Yeah. Yeah. In 1987, Simon Schuster bought the syndicate from the remaining family members. Um, so, you know, they basically the remaining family members ran it for five years and then were kind of like, eh, fuck it. They sold it to Simon and Schuster uh, and Simon and Schuster continues to publish Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew to this day. And on that note, ad break. <laughs> Act two, the real writers. So now that we've examined the overall structure of the syndicate, let's talk some more about the two largest writers that were involved in the syndicate, Leslie McFarlane and our girl, old dirty Mildred Wirt Benson. Yup, 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 yup. Oh, Millie Wirty B. Um, I, I feel safe in saying that right now in North America, the only people talking about Leslie McFarlane and Mildred Ward Benson are in this room right now. Yep. 100%. <laughs> uh, Charles Leslie McFarlane was born on October 25th, 1902 in Carrollton Place, Ontario. He was a journalist, novelist, screenwriter, and filmmaker. Ironically, in death, the thing that he was most widely known for is the Hardy Boys, which he never received credit for uh, for the majority of his existence. Uh, the son of a school principal, McFarland became a freelance writer just out of high school. Um, which I'm curious about, like, what level, like, obviously, today, being a professional journalist out of high school would be nuts. But in 1915 or 1920, like, what is, comparatively, like, if you can read, are you, like, a, a wunderkind in 1920? I don't, I have no <laughs> grasp of that, you know? He was 10 Yeah, basically, yeah. Um, he moved to Whitby, Ontario to pursue a career in writing, uh, and he wrote a book about this time later in life called A, H- a Kid from Haleybury, which is a very difficult Canadian town to pronounce because you want to say Halebury, but it's Haleybury. 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 Um, Halleybury. Halleybury is from Haleybury. Uh, he bounced around after that. Uh, working for different newspapers before moving to Springfield, Massachusetts to work for the Springfield Republican. I wonder if he was actually a Republican. Uh, I mean, it didn't seem like that he was, considering yeah. that he just hated cops. Yeah, it's very true. Yeah. But the, but Republicans hate big government. Cops are part of the government? I don't know. I have no idea. They respect the boys in blue. Yeah. Blue lives matter. Blue. Uh, yeah, now they do. But also weren't Republicans in the 20s? They were the liberal party. Oh, yeah. Good for him. I hope he was a Republican. Um, But also the racism stuff. Um, 
While there, he replied to an ad in a local paper. Everything's fucked. Everything's fucked. There's no... There's no... Yeah. There's no There's no good way out of this. It's like, you, who do you root for at Home Alone? Kevin or the parents? They're all, they're all kind of assholes. Yeah. Um, what a terrible family. You didn't root for the Wet Bandits? I was always rooting for the Wet Bandits. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah. If I mean, they, all they were doing was trying... They were just... They were just robbing a house. Petty, petty theft. Yeah. They, they weren't trying to murder somebody like Kevin. Yeah. They weren't trying to murder somebody. They weren't a they weren't a spoiled little brat. Yeah. They weren't a horrible family that makes their son sleep in the attic. Yeah. What the fuck is that shit? Because he got his pizza stolen and just stood up for himself? Yeah. Uh while well, they replied to an ad in a local paper looking for talented deadline oriented writers. It was uh this ad was for the Stratemeyer Syndicate. And he got the job. And from 1926 to 1927, he wrote seven Dave Fearless novels, which I have never heard Which is heard now of. your new... It is. It is 100% my new stage name. This is Dave Fearless and... Uh, yeah, this is Deep Cuts. I'm Dave Fearless. And Andrew... Uh, we have, we'll, we'll, oh, yeah, we we'll haven't discover figured out. mine yeah, yeah. later yeah, yeah. on. Are you going to be Andrew Wirt Benson? Yes. <laughs> um, so he wrote seven. Over the course of one year, he wrote seven Dave Fearless novels. Um, these were successful for the Stratemeyer syndicate. So he got hired, uh, to write on the Hardy boys. McFarlane contributed 21 books in the series, um, from 1927 to 1946. That's crazy to me. That's almost 20 years. World changes a lot from 1927 to 1946. That's fucking nuts. You go through two world wars, the depression. That's crazy. He's just out here. Writing sweater vests and yeah, and after all that colors. time, people haven't just realized like these boys are always right. Maybe <laughs> we should just listen to them from the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Frank and Joe Hardy for co-president during the Great Depression. Stratemeyer lowered McFarland's rate to eighty-five dollars per book. However, he lowered everybody else's rate to seventy-five. Oh, really? Yeah. So he he McFarland was his favorite writer. Yeah. He gave him the extra 10. Wouldn't it be fucked up if Todd McFarlane, who is also from Canada, was related to Charles Leslie Foss, uh, McFarlane? Except for he, I mean, if if uh, reincarnation is a thing he, and he was reincarnated as Todd McFarlane and that's the thing is with reincarnation, you just get the same last name. I mean, I just he, meant like what if they were related by he family? Re- but he yes. reached the next stage like from being like a freelance writer who just got totally <laughs> fucked over for his entire life and died in obscurity to being like the guy who just like fucking just owned everything owned everything and was like fuck this yeah i'm gonna be rich that, off now that shit. just that just makes me want to see like charles leslie foster or Mc, charles leslie mcfarland being like hey bud hey bud today <laughs> Today, but all right, but we're gonna just draw some spawn. A and then bio, we're gonna... a biopic of of of, of the Stratemeyer Syndicate where he plays Leslie McFarland. <laughs> um, McFarland didn't like writing the books, calling them his uh, nuisance books. And um, his family, like in retrospect, like recently, like they have sort of they have sort of said like they've sort of like retconned it and said that he loved the Hardy boys and, and loved writing the books. And Bullshit. I wonder, and I wonder what that is. Cause it's like, they're not, they're not making any money. It's not like they need to like keep up like a, like a, like appearances, you know, to you know, stay in good standing with Simon and Schuster or whatever. It's almost like they just, no, but you're playing to the, the fan base. Yeah. The you only just, people that care about yeah, you just want, you, Leslie McFarlane. Yeah. You want to, you don't, but yeah, it's, it's interesting how that once a legacy presents itself, people around it need to feel like they need to, preserve that legacy in some way after he wrote them he never read them again and they were always first draft and done like he never went back and like fixed them and i i read stratemeyer loved him so much that he didn't mind that the first drafts were just riddled with typos and he was just like ah the books are good enough we'll we'll copy edit it it's fine yeah where normally that that would other writers that would have they would have been fired for that yeah he got caught in a loop basically though where uh you know he'd say I, i'm never gonna write another one of these juvenile books again and then bills would come and you know he'd kind of have to write another one which again is a very similar thing to just when i thought i was out yeah they, they pulled pull me back pull in. me back in again um years later his daughter would say that uh he was happy to have the work and was not upset about the way that he was treated um which that yeah, just just sounds like Stockholm syndrome to me. On his part or her part? Maybe a little bit of both. I don't know. Like, do you think he actually said that, or do you think she's making it up? I don't know. I don't know. I feel like 
especially it's interesting too because with the with familial relationships like that especially with your daughter you kind of want to I could see it either way, honestly, because you, you want it to be a situation where you look at me, I'm living my truth, I'm a writer, and I'm getting paid to write, but also, I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I guess it's a little bit of like what you said of just like, you know, kind of looking at the past in, ro- in rose-tinted glasses because, you know, his legacy, you know, they don't have any money from it. All they have is the legacy. All they have is the fact that he did write these beloved books so you don't want to tarnish that by being like, yeah, he hated every fucking minute of it. Yeah. You know, the only thing you can really have is just the admiration of the fans. Yeah. And a better narrative is to say that he loved it. Yeah, it's kayfabe, man. You're, you're, you're playing for the cheap seats. You want those marks to give you, uh, you know, whatever. You're doing work. Yep, absolutely. Um, McFarlane also wrote for both the Donna Girls and the Nancy Drew series. Uh, his final work for the syndicate was Hardy Boys and the Phantom Freighter, which is a great title, which he wrote in 1946. McFarlane also had a prolific career in film and TV. He moved back to Canada and worked for the National Film Board of Canada. He wrote and directed docu-series, um, a selection of which include The Royal Journey, Here's Hockey, which is a documentary about ice hockey, who would have thunk it, and The Herring Hunt, which is an Oscar-nominated short film about hunting herring. Yeah, he really he, he became like the the Jordan Peele of nature Canadian nature, nature. Doc- documentaries. Yeah, totally. Like, who would have fucking known? Yeah. Uh, he also worked in TV after that, writing for CBC for a bunch of years. He moved to Toronto to pursue that later in life. Uh, Charles Leslie McFarlane, a.k.a. Big Les, a.k.a. Just Leslie, died on September 6th. 1977 at 74 years old in Oshawa, Ontario. A book was written about him in 2004 titled The Secret of the Hardy Boys, Leslie McFarlane and the Stratemeyer Syndicate, written by Marilyn Greenwald. Um, His archive was bought by McMaster University in 2006, um, which is kind of nice. There's been a bunch of universities doing stuff like this um recently well i mean i guess 2006 is a while ago but you know what i mean like uh i think is it there's a there's a university in chicago that just bought all of dan claus's records and stuff Mm -hmm. and then there's another university i feel like it's georgetown maybe uh that bought all of chris claremont's records and journals and notebooks and stuff and it's it's really nice to see these kind of like more literary establishments taking genre fiction seriously, you know? Um, and it makes you, it makes one wonder if there weren't 15 X-Men movies, would they care about Chris Claremont? I don't know. Yeah. It's a little depressing to me when I frame it that way, but it's fine. It's fine. We're not here to cry. We're here to, we're here to talk about the Hardy Boys. Uh, next up, big, big, big dread, old Mildred Wirt Benson, uh, was born on July 10th, 1905 in Laredo, Iowa. Uh, she wrote 23 of the first 30 Nancy Drew books and is widely credited as establishing what makes the character so beloved by the young and old alike. Mildred was born with um, with the name Mildred Augustine, which is honestly a way cooler name. Um, but she married Asa Wirt in 1928, uh, and she took his last name. He was a um, Associated Press journalist. Um, Having gained an English degree from the University of Iowa in 1925, she returned in 1927 to gain a master's degree in journalism, and she was the first student to graduate with the university with said degree. Uh, her first husband, oh, see, I even read, wrote it here in the outline, fuck me. Uh, her first husband, Asa, was a member of the Associated Press. After he died in 1947, she married George A. Benson, not George Benson, the comedian, but George A. Benson. Uh, who was an editor for the Toledo Blade? Also, Toledo Blade is a good character name. Uh, yeah, they should have na- they should have made that the author of the Nancy <laughs> Drew books. Yeah, no shit, right? Yeah. Um, Mildred Wirt Benson worked as a journalist for fifty eight years, writing a weekly column for the Toledo Blade, writing many books, and after her retirement, she continued freelancing as an obituary writer up until a few months before her death at ninety six years old nice yeah i think that's it's really admirable when you see kind of like just in black and white these these more kind of like journeyman creatives um and like just the sheer 
versatility and volume of the things that they had to do to like make ends meet. It's fucking crazy, man. I mean, in one respect, it's a little sad that she had to, I don't, I don't know. Maybe she didn't have to, but she chose to work, um, as an obituary writer, you know, into her nineties. But there's something that, I mean, I relate to that. She ended her career by writing (laughs) Writing about death. Yeah. Her own. I'm kind of into that. Like I, I fully relate to the, I am a work a day, work a day, work a day person. And like, the idea of maybe I'll feel different when I'm fucking 90, but the idea of not working and not like trying to do a thing, it's very, it's anathema to me. Like I don't, I don't quite. Yeah. I, I can, I never, I can't fathom wanting to retire. But I guess it's different if, I guess it's a little bit different when it's like, oh, you and I are both creative people who have creative pursuits and we need to scratch that itch and we're artists. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you want you, when you work in like the grocery store industry for 30 years, like yeah. you're, you want to retire. Like yeah, you're just, your whole life is like, when can I just not, not do, do this, this anymore? Yeah, but totally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like pe- people who, uh, people constantly announce retirements, like filmmakers and actors and all these things. And they should just n- not say it. Because they're they're always going to eventually go back on it. Yeah. Because it's like you should just you should just never re- announce a retirement when you your job is something that you love. Yep. Agreed. And, and that is like integral to your own like yeah. life enjoyment. Yeah. Um, Benson, more so than any of the other writers on the mystery series, is often thought of as the real creator of Nancy Drew. She was there ostensibly from the beginning. She sculpted the character, and ostensibly established the series for what it is uh you might be asking yourself if all these people were ghost artists and they signed confidentiality agreements how do you two know all this shit and the answer to that question is that in 1980 gossett and dunlap the publisher of the nancy drew and the hardy boys books um sued the syndicate they sued the syndicate because they uh harriet adams harriet stratemeyer adams uh, the sales were dipping on the books, and she decided, well, you know what? I'm going to put the books out in soft cover for the first time. Um, and Gossett and Dunlap were like, uh, I don't think so. We have the print publication rights. She was like, well, no, you have the hardback print publication rights. We never signed a deal for the paperback. Um, and so massive court case ensues. And because of this, Mildred Wirt Benson uh, was basically called as a witness, and she was one of the first— she was one of the only people that, for some reason, Stratemeyer didn't make sign a confidentiality agreement. So she basically kind of like outed the syndicate, which is crazy because it started in 19 fucking 20 and made it until 1980. Yeah, this whole thing became public record because of this one lawsuit. Nuts. Yeah. So she kind of outed everybody and then other people got called into the court case and basically broke their confidentiality agreements um, because they were you know, being brought in a court of law. And, um, you know, she was the one who basically said, like, these were the, this is the, she's the reason why we know the amount of money that people were paid. She's the the reason we know who wrote what book. Um, And obviously, during this court case, a bunch of legal documents had to be turned over, which is why a bunch of this other information is out there. Um, But it's still just, like, fucking crazy that they were doing this for 60 odd years. Like, there are humans that don't live 60 years. And they, they kept this crazy secret of, like, seven book franchises, 10 book franchises that all sold millions and millions of copies. It's crazy. It occurred to me that this is very similar to something that actually just kind of happened. And I, I realized that this this thing is very similar to this whole story. So there's this Swedish satanic metal band called Ghost. And they have gotten really popular over the last several years. They kind of, their first album was in like 2013, I think like that. And their whole thing is they're this band who is like this satanic cult. And the lead singer wears this like elaborate dark Pope costume. Mm -hmm. And then all the other band members are called nameless ghouls. And they just wear these like faceless masks. And so they're all anonymous and uh, ostensibly their whole kayfabe was that they're like this satanic cult that makes music. Mm-hmm. And for... I love the design of their masks, by yeah, the way. Their yeah. masks are awesome. I've, I've recently gotten really obsessed with this band, you know, for exactly the reasons that you're talking about, where I like the albums, but the theatrical mythology around them is really interesting and fascinating. 
And so for years, they sort of went on as this sort of enigma where kind of like the the residents, which is this other musical art collective where, you know, you've just we've never known who they were. They've remained anonymous from the 60s until today. But with Ghost, what the reality of the situation is, is that Ghost is one guy. It's this guy named Tobias Forge, and he's a Swedish musician. And he operates the band as a solo project where he writes and records all the albums. And then he has a live band that plays the nameless ghouls. And he's the lead singer. He's the guy in the Pope yeah. costume. So what happened was two of the members from the original lineup of the band, after they quit or were kicked out or whatever, um, they kind of like... Were under the they were under the assumption that they were like members of the band and that they were entitled to royalties from mm. album sales. Mm. And when they left the band, it was basically like, "No, you're not. You were like work for hire, like, like were they live actually, musicians. Were they actually involved in the songwriting process? No, they, not at all. So they they were just they were just kind of like live a, kind of like players. The Tame Impala situation where like Kevin Parker, Kevin Porter, whatever the fuck that guy's name is, like he is Tame Impala, but he has a touring band and they market themselves as a band, but it's not really, it's just him. Yeah, or and, like or Boston or any of these bands. Boston is a dude? Yeah, Boston is one guy. I had no idea. Yeah, he's the central songwriter and the guitarist and everybody else in Boston were just session players. I had no idea. Um you know who else is interesting? It's kind of in this similar ballpark. Is a same a court case happened with the Smiths that is exactly this, where Johnny Marr and and Morrissey they're the only two who legally signed the contracts with the record company, and they, but for legal purposes, are the Smiths. Mike Joyce and Andy Rourke, the bassist and the drummer, um, are not part of the band. They're work for hire musicians, and when the Smiths broke up. They were getting royalties, and then when the Smiths broke up, they didn't get royalties anymore. And they sued Mar Morrissey and Marr in, like, the 2000s, basically being like, what the fuck, bro? And the day before the court case was going to be decided, I think I'm getting my members backwards. I don't remember if it was Andy or Mike, but one of them had a coke addiction and needed money really badly. And so he settled with Morrissey and Marr for, like, $50,000. Because he didn't think they were going to win. And the next day, they won. And Mike Joyce, or whichever one, either Mike or Andy, whichever one didn't settle, got all of those back royalties. And he got fifty. He got a $50,000 Coke party. <laughs> yeah. It's so sad. But it's, it's interesting, though, because the way you're explaining it, and I, who knows in live performances how, these, how the songs evolve or whatever, but, like, saying that Mike Royce and Andy Joyce, saying that Mike and Andy aren't part of the Smiths is just crazy. Yeah. Like, they just are. The Smiths is not Morrissey and Marr. I would like it to be because it makes the romantic idea of that, because they are a duo, you know, they're like the center of that band. There is no there is no Smiths without, without Morrissey and Marr, but also the Smiths are the four of them. Yeah, and their their identities are known and their, yeah. their talents are sort of like integral to the yeah, yeah. band. So that's really just on paper. They just kind of got screwed out of things. And this is similar to that, except for, uh, number one, uh, all these musicians were just hired to play live. Their identities were purposely obscured to the point where it was like who you are as a person is irrelevant. You, it's not you. You're just a player. You're just, you're just the guitar player who's playing these you're songs You're performing live. a service, yeah. Um, and I realized that it was just ex almost exactly like the Stratemeyer Syndicate, like, like uh, formula or, yeah, like yeah. The, you know, the, the, the infrastructure of it. And so um, these uh, these guys left, um, and they were like, "Like we need we get royalties. Like we we were members of the band. We we were like we were part of the band." And uh, the the guy Tobias Forge was basically like, "No, you're not. Like this is all mine." Um, so they sued, and so in the same way that this happened, in this lawsuit happening, this entire kayfabe was un uh, was revealed of like it awesome. was it was revealed that ghost is just one dude love it and everybody else is just hired musicians that rotate out and he's he's um he records all these albums by himself and then gets this band and that the whole like satanic 
cult thing is just it's just a fictional like yeah, but, but character. Is anybody really surprised by that? Uh, not necessarily that it's like surprised by it, but it's like it's it's. I think it's more of just like everybody thought it was a band doing the shtick. A band doing the shtick, and also secondarily, like when that sort of mystique is up, you get to sort of enjoy it or whatever, and kind of like yeah, it definitely. And, is. and then when it's revealed, it's like oh, it's just like some Swedish guy, which is like <laughs> of course, yes, obviously it's just a Swedish guy, but not the 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 plus or minus not knowing is the fun part. I agree. Yeah. But I, I will say that the only thing I love more than kayfabe is when kayfabe gets destroyed. I love that shit. Yeah. I love when, you know. It's really fascinating. Yeah. It's yeah. like because of this court case and because these, these you know, these but that's court also, cases that's become the public best record. Way, though. That's the best way. You want it to end in a court case. You don't yeah. want it to end on, as mean as this is to say, you don't want it to end on the artist's terms. You know what I mean? You want the mystique to be torn away and revealed what's underneath. Yeah. You don't want it to end uh in the kiss way of like yeah doing it's just sad doing, a, doing a 40 minute uh primetime television special the unmasking yeah where they take off the makeup and it's like uh and then they try to make music where they're not in makeup and they're all like weird looking and like old middle-aged dudes and you're just like this isn't cool yeah like pretend to be a demon and a space cat again yeah you know um but yeah i just thought it was fascinating that the parallels are very similar and it's like yeah this this these I, I doubt that Tobias Forge ever heard about any of this shit. And yeah. He sort of, I mean, I think his thing is a little bit more ethical than this. But oh, yeah. He just had the same strategy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I love the theatrics of any of that shit. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm always a sucker for when somebody is like, no, my name's not Gary anymore. My name is now Tombstone McHardface. And on that note, old dirty Millie Wordy B opened all the floodgates, released all this information out into the world, and sort of allowed people to take credit for their work, kind of. Um, obviously, there are many writers who've contributed, uh, not just to the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew, but the other syndicate books. Um, but uh, for the sake of a somewhat concise discussion about the topic... We just, we're going to live in it to these two creators. So thanks for speaking up in that lawsuit, Millie Wordy B. Thank God she did, because now we have this, this fascinating time. story to talk about. Yep. And uh, ad break. Conspiracies within conspiracies. So some of the stuff we've kind of talked over a little bit, but one of the things I kind of wanted to bring up and drill down a little bit into about the like iterative nature of creativity or the, the kind of people that are drawn to iterative production models, or they seem to be an intersection between someone who's moderately talented that has a keen business sense, or at least perceives themselves as having a keen business sense. Um, the three examples that come to mind for me immediately are Stan Lee, which we've talked about at length, Shotaro Ishinomori, which we've talked about at length, and Charlie Band, the guy who formed Full Moon Films. Uh, I recently read a book about him called It Came From the Video Isle, which is fascinating. Um, if you're not aware, Charlie Band was a horror movie producer uh, in the 80s and 90s who rode a wave of direct-to-VHS genre films. He specialized in um, direct-to-VHS science fiction and mostly horror films, and he is the person behind <coughs> Puppet Master, Ghoulies, The Dolls, um, Doll Man, um, uh, and, and a myriad of other Ginger Dead Man, Evil Bong, uh just a myriad of these it's a horror movie with a tiny cute thing attacking normal sized people and killing them and that's the, it's the same movie every time except for the puppet master movies which bizarrely take a turn into world war ii for some reason i don't really understand why there are so many puppet master movies about them fighting nazis he basically he basically saw gremlins and then yeah it's like this is this is own it. thing yeah he i mean he had a franchise of gremlins ripoff movies called ghoulies yeah and it's so interesting. And I, I think sometimes they say things, the iterative nature of things is related to the person and something about them. 
Like, I think for EJ Subaraya, the guy who created Ultraman, the fact that there are, like, 500 Ultramans, it's a religious component for him. You know, he wanted the Ultraman face to look like the Buddha mask. He wanted the this idea of a superheroic being protecting Earth from these monsters, which are actually metaphors for these larger socioeconomic, sociopolitical struggles that the world is going through. Um, he wanted that to, there to be this kind of, you know, the kind of trite and pedantic idea of modern mythology of this God figure that we, that would help humanity solve its, its more uh, dark impulses for Stan Lee. I think on a good day, you could say that his iterative, it's a scientist who gets, has an accident and turns into a superhero. You could say that it's the same thing. I don't know if I fully buy it because Stan's involvement in some of that stuff is dubious. Um, but that's a longer conversation with Charlie Band and with Edward Stratemeyer. It's murkier to me if it's a exercising of personal demons, like if Ed Stratemeyer just didn't get hugged as an, enough as a kid, mm-hmm. or if it's a business thing where he just like Rover Boys was a success and he was like, and now we make 500 clones of Rover Boys. With Charlie Band, it is very, I think, overtly a business thing. I think it's, oh, this made money. What can we do that's the exact same thing and make more money? Um, but it's it's fascinating to me to see all these people <coughs> approach creativity in this way. And I think there's also something, I don't know if it's just because we're talking about genre fiction and for so long genre fiction was dominated by male create creators, but all of these iterative things, James Bond is a perfect example, they're usually shepherded by men, you know? It's a less... But I guess that's not true. We just talked about Mildred Wirt Benson for like 40 minutes. But it, I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's kind of a, uh, it's a chicken of the egg scenario because it's like, yeah. is there something germane to men doing that? Or is it like you just said, because there just wasn't as many women creators doing things back then? Yeah. Because they weren't allowed to like yeah. socially. Yep. Yeah, I don't know. It's fascinating. Um, but, I mean, even today, it's like the the modern-day version of this is like somebody like Tyler Perry. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, very – it's the same story every time. But it's then you the have, same Aesop's fable Yeah, every but then time. you have like Shonda Rhimes. She's kind of – has a similar type I, of thing. I'm not familiar enough with her work to know if it's iterative <coughs> or if she's just prolific. Yeah, I guess it's not – yeah, I guess it's not iterative because they're all – the but, shows are all different. Yeah, but but – specifically what's his face uh tyler perry like a lot of that is iterative yeah you know it's it's this time medea does this this time family must you know deal with their wayward son who got out of prison this time family must deal with this girl and then there's a religious parable yeah and it's 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 crazy too because it's now that i bring that up it is very it's so similar to the point where there's actually a recent thing where he got criticized because he posted this thing on Instagram where he showed, um, he was like, these are the scripts I wrote in 2019. And it was, he currently has like 10 shows on the air. Hmm. And he personally wrote every episode of all 10 shows. He doesn't have any of the writers working on any of his shows. So he's like showing, he's showing this table with all these printed scripts and it's like, it's like, uh, you know, in a, in a year in like a season or whatever, it's like 20 episodes of 10 shows. And he has all of these physical scripts like printed out and sitting on there. And then all of his movies that he's written and he personally wrote all of them by himself. And he was like, this is what I did in 2019. And he just like p- uploaded that to Instagram and he got a lot of backlash because there's a lot of people being like, you know, you are in a position where you should be like uh, giving jobs to uh, black writers and you're just like a gatekeeper because you just won't Mm -hmm. give people jobs and you do it all yourself or whatever. Uh, But he's kind of, he's like doing the Stratemeyer syndicate, but he's not exploiting anybody. Yeah. Because he literally writes everything by himself would it be amazing though if like tomorrow there's just a reveal that he has like a whole network of people that he's fucking over and taking I mean, all these groups? You, want, you you almost assume that that's got to be the case because you're like, how could somebody physically do that? He wrote he wrote like 
in a year he wrote like like 200 scripts for TV shows. That's insane. I mean, obviously they're all fucking terrible, but he still t- he still typed all those scripts though. Yeah, good for him, man. If he actually did that, yeah, I don't know. That's that's interesting to me too because it's like, I mean, I understand that impulse of like bringing everybody up, <coughs> and I think that there's a legitimate conversation around that. But there's there's also the other side, which is kind of like you're a writer. You've worked your entire life to write things, not hire other people to write things. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, no, I, I, I understand the – like if, if you and I just like fell into a, a billion dollars tomorrow, no offense, but I don't know if I would be hiring a bunch of writers. I'd be like, I'm going to write a bunch of things now I and mean, we're going to make them. I 100% agree with you. I, that, that was sort of my reaction to this because this thing kind of happened and some people – in, in my office, we're talking about it. And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm treading lightly here because I'm sort of on the outside of this community. And it's not really my place to really have much of an opinion about this. I understand the cultural importance of it. But also, like, you can go fuck yourself if you ever tried to tell me how I do my own art. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, like I understand that, um, you know, certain X amount, like whatever marginalized group people need to be given opportunities and platforms. And it would be a whole different story if Tyler Perry was like hiring exclusively white writers. And it's like, what the fuck? Like you're, you're totally dropping the ball on being this, this gatekeeper for this industry. But if he wants to write it all himself, he can fucking write it all himself. That's his own. That's he, he is not responsible for. Yeah. He's not personally responsible for lifting up that, industry in that way and also he, he wants he to write his own give, shit he gives a ton of people opportunities he's writing all black casts yeah black actors crews. production yeah yeah he's made, he's generating a lot of work but i think there's it's interesting it's interesting because ultimately my point is like he's doing exactly the opposite of this yeah 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 whether he's aware of it or not not wouldn't it be amazing if he had a, like a giant tattoo that just said fuck edward <laughs> 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 he, he just grew up loving Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew, and then f- watched, you know, it watched broke, broke the, his heart. Yeah, watched the 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 Mildred Wirt Benson testimony live on TV, just weeping. How could you, Carolyn Keene and Franklin W. Dixon are not real people. No, goes to his little typewriter. I'm gonna just write these wrongs myself. Clickety clack, clickety clack, clickety Have, clack. He'll, he had his world shattered in the same way that I did whenever I discovered that uh, it wasn't. A woman named Hannah Barbara. It was two guys named <laughs> Hannah, Hannah and Barbara. Barbara. <laughs> That's amazing. I don't think I actually knew that. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't think I ever didn't not know that it was named Hannah Barbara. I genuinely thought that those cartoons were made by a woman named Hannah Barbara. Awesome, adorable. <laughs> I love it. I feel like uh, before we close this episode out, we need to discuss Rudy Nappy. Uh, he's or Nappi. I don't know how to pronounce his name. N a p p i. Whatever it is, he didn't get any fucking money. No, he really didn't. But I bet that he got more money than all these other motherfuckers. Yeah. Uh, if you're not familiar, Rudy Nappy is the painter who did all of the illustrations for um, the covers for the Nancy Drew. Hardy Boy and every other pulp novel from like 1930 to 1985. Um, Hyper prolific, brilliant draftsman who codified that kind of like 50s aesthetic of the two guys wearing sweaters or Nancy Drew wearing a yellow sweater, you know, looking off to the side. Um, It's, it's, uh, I, I don't think you can overstate the amount of importance that he has had on the legacy and the success of those books. Um, I know that obviously he was brought in for the fifties revamp, but I think he's the reason why they've lasted past multiple generations of people, because there's something about the visualization of a young person seeing a young person looking. Um, it's almost like the weaponization of gaze, uh, that I think is very, um, germane to the subject matter. And, um, it, it, crystallizes everything that is good about the uh f- you know f- the almost the the sub genre that is Stratemeyer syndicate books into like you can look at any of those novels and it's 
you instantly know what it is. It's these young people, yeah. they're solving a mystery, go. And his shape language is so alluring. His color palettes are so timeless. It it's just yeah, if if I if I could uh afford to own a piece of Rudy Nappy artwork and have it on my wall. I don't know that I would ever need to see another piece of artwork again. Yeah, I mean, it's a similar story to, uh, you know, another very similar thing where in the 90s, um, Goosebumps. Mm, completely. Uh, you know, uh, so, you know, Arl Stein wrote the books and all the covers were done by uh, an artist named Tim Jacobus. And, you know, obviously those books were massively popular. Um and Arl Stein is impossibly rich because of it. Uh, but, you know, Tim Jac- Jacobus, he was hired on, you know, as a work for hire. He got like a couple thousand bucks per cover. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, no no royalties whatsoever. And it's like, okay, yeah, like of course, he didn't get royalties. He was just doing a piece of art on contract or whatever. But that that narrative becomes very murky when you take into consideration the fact that like the reason why that book series got popular indisputably was because of the covers. Yep. Those paintings were yeah. immediately the thing that was like, I got to know why the fuck this goo is hitting this dude's face. Yeah. That, that book series took off the way it did because they stuck them at the scholastic book fairs and you're walking around and like that jumps out at you and you're like, I have to buy this. Yeah. And, you know, the the books, it's like, I loved Goosebumps when I was a kid. I literally have a box of like a hundred of them in my office right now. Wasn't, I, wasn't I, R.L. Stein uh, some, not necessarily as bad as the Stratemeyer, Stratemeyer Syndicate, but didn't he also like not write most of them? Uh, later on, oh, okay. he, he there was like the original Goosebumps series, which he wrote. And then there was like Goosebumps 2000. And then that was whenever he kind of became more of the shepherd of the franchise. The Stanley. Yeah. Um, but even when he did write them, like I'm actually, I dug these books out of my parents' garage and uh, my son was here at my office and he picked them up or whatever. And so he brought them home with us and he wants, he wanted me to read them. So I'm like reading uh, some Goosebump books to him now and we're reading uh, Monster Blood, which is like the, f- it's like the third mm. book ever written. And as much as I loved that series growing up, like those books, it's not that good. Like the the, the yeah. actual book of it, it's definitely a like this cover is doing like sixty five percent of the heavy lifting, right? Right. Of this book being cool, yeah. And to think that like a guy became massively rich on writing some decent kids books that were made a national phenomenon because of the covers, and the guy who drew those like got a couple thousand bucks and nothing. Yeah. It's kind of fucking crazy. Yeah, it, it sucks. Um, and, you know, same thing with old Dirty Rudy. That guy didn't, he didn't see shit. Yeah. Um, but now his paintings sell for, like, literally millions on heritage auctions and shit. Um, so hopefully his family is getting some money. I don't know. The nappies. Yeah. <laughs> What made the these books um, so alluring and so sort of special? I think it's safe to say that most media that we consume as kids is largely based on some kind of power fantasy. And, you know, while I'm sure that for a lot of kids growing up, uh, you know, a story about like a kid who is getting bullied uh, at school and then he like gets bitten by a radioactive spider and turns into this like impossibly strong hero that has to like pretend like he's not as strong as he is. I'm sure that that was helpful for a lot of kids growing up. For me, I was always the tallest, biggest kid in any group of kids I was ever in. So I I never had an issue with bullying. So I didn't gravitate as much to that kind of thing. Um, uh, but and you're deathly afraid of red and blue spandex yes, specifically yeah i have a total like clockwork orange reaction to it i just yep. start vomiting yep when i see it mm-hmm. um i've seen it before yeah. when i came out in my spider-man costume yeah, for halloween we, yeah and i just started vomiting on me mm-hmm. yeah 
Uh, so, you know, so I, I wasn't as much, I think that's probably why I wasn't really into superhero comics when I was a kid. Uh, but I think cause you were always extremely powerful and good looking. Yes. Yeah. Um, it must've been so hard for you. It was, um, <laughs> but, but what was, but what I gravitated towards, uh, you know, and I, I, I almost like have been processing this. I mean, I've, I've, I've thought these things and processed these things over the years and years, but even more kind of crystallizing them just thinking about this now in preparation for this episode, uh, you know, but whenever I was a kid, whenever I was in, whenever I was in fifth grade, uh, you know, my, 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 my family, uh, particularly my mom, uh, made my grandmother the sort of like matriarchal center figure to our entire universe. And, um, you know, to the point where like my grandparents owned a grocery store. And when I was a kid, like I spent like pretty much, all of my time outside of school at this grocery store. When we weren't at the grocery store, we were at my grandparents' house. Whenever, whenever my, we all went on vacations together. Whenever my grandparents moved somewhere, we moved with them. Um, and uh, and then when I, whenever I was in fifth grade, my grandma just got lung cancer and died. And not only did she die, but we were sort of forced to witness the slow um, rendering of this matriarchal godlike figure into this sort of broken person that you know passed away uh because uh i grew up in uh in new mexico and whenever she was dealing with the cancer she was transferred to this uh hospital in lubbock texas because they had like really good like chemotherapy programs there or whatever it was the 90s so things were kind of a little bit more experimental with chemotherapy and radiation and stuff so we like basically moved to Lubbock and lived there for five weeks. Um, and I was taken out of school and we uh, just basically slept in a hotel room at night and then in the morning woke up and just went to the hospital and just lived in the hospital by day. We would just be in the big waiting room the entire day. We would eat at the cafeteria for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And uh, so I was just sort of forced to watch that happen and play out over five weeks. So that was sort of my introductory to like the concept of mortality and the fact that like people die and that like people who are important to you can just randomly die out of nowhere. Um, and, uh, you know, during that period and almost kind of in this weird kind of like crossing of all these different uh, formative things that were happening to me as a child, whenever we, you know, during those days hanging out in the waiting room, I don't know if it was a magazine that I had or if it was something in the hospital, but there was this kind of like oriental trading company type magazine, like a catalog. And I was looking through it and I saw that they were selling like a, like a multi-disc set of like old detective serial, like radio serials. And so I just uh, asked my mom if I could just order it because we were just, we were just living there for weeks and weeks. So I, my mom let me and so I was able to order this thing and it got delivered to the hotel and I had a portable CD player. So I would just like sit there listening to these detective serials um, during this whole process. And so after that happened, uh, I became like obsessed with mystery, like books. And like, I think I, I had some interest in it beforehand. Um, otherwise, why would I have wanted to get those, those CDs? But like, from that point on, I was like ravenously obsessed with mystery books. And so like going to the library, whether it was the school library or just the local library, like the, the Hardy boys and Nancy drew were just there like for me. Like it was like, I need mystery books. Here they are. Here's 30 that I can just read. And it's like a pool of content to pull from. Um, and so Hardy boys and Nancy drew were like, almost it, they were like a gateway because I read all those books. And then after that, it was like, Oh, I need more. I need more. And then that was like, I started reading books that like I was way too young to even be reading. Cause it was just the next thing of like, I'm out of these books and I've read encyclopedia Brown and I've read all these things. So what's next. And so I started reading like, you know, the Sue Grafton books, the ABC murder books and, uh, and, and then like Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett and I just, I just got so obsessed with mystery novels and the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew were just like the beginning of that for me. And I think for me, you know, the power fantasy of it or the, you know, what they meant to me was um, like 
there were these kids who like could figure out the solution to a problem. Like they could make sense of, of anything. Uh, so, you know, no matter, no matter what problem there was, no matter what issue was, was happening, uh, you know, cause after that whole thing with my grandma happened, like my, my family kind of like was never good again. Uh, and, and, and when you're going through a situation like that, like, it's like everything made sense to you up to a point. And then suddenly it's like, I don't know, we don't know how to make this work again. Like what, like what has to happen for everything to click back into place and things to go back to the way that they were. So, you know, as a, in, as a kid, any kid in general, but especially kids going through something like that, it's like these kids, they can just solve it. Like they, they, they're always one step ahead of, of everything. And no matter what's going on, they're going to get to the bottom of it and they're going to, it's going to be wrapped up in a bow with a solution at the end of this book. And the re- the repetitive iterative nature of it was almost like a plus. It was almost kind of part of the appeal of it. Cause it's like, it's like this comfort thing, this comfort food of like every book. I know it's going to be like the same thing and there's going to be this problem and I, and I'm going to anticipate all the beats of how they're starting to piece it together. And then at the end it's all done and they've sort of, wrapped it up and solved it. So I I think that was really what those books meant to me. Yeah. I mean, it's funny listening to you break it down that way because my, my connection to it is bizarrely similar in that it comes from a traumatic place, but it, you're, I think obviously yours is much darker. Um, but like I grew up in a really kind of repressive conservative Christian environment. My dad had some stuff that he was working through and that got manifested in my sisters and I having the joyous, uh, joyous indoctrination into uh, you know a, a very specific sect of Christianity. And as a as a small person, I was consistently consumed by fear and guilt. Mm-hmm. And I knew that stuff wasn't right, but I didn't know why it wasn't right. But I still believed in this system that was being presented to me, and I was still trying to make the world make sense in that way and i was grappling with these kind of two truths of like this ecosystem of ideological thought that my parental figures were or figure was giving me and then like just an understanding implicitly inside somewhere that that wasn't accurate to the world in some way but then feeling immense pain and guilt over this knee jerk of like, this doesn't seem right. Shut yeah. the fuck up. It is right. You got to have faith. Like this is, you're being tempted. You have to squash this inner voice. And I connected so deeply with Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys because of exactly the same thing that you're talking about. Yeah, the, the determinism they, of it. It's like, yes. this is going to play out. They are going to figure it out. Not you can, even, an, I mean, you can anticipate I, that. I, I enjoyed that, but it wasn't that for me, it wasn't even that for me, it was specifically the fact that the youthful mind is not insane. Yeah. That, the, that youth does not inherently corrupt perception. Yeah. Your, your, your thoughts of there, that this youthful, doesn't make you, sense is not invalid. Yes. Yes. And you could potentially have a point. Yeah. And in some ways it shaped who I am as a person because Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew, I read all of those or had them read to me um, by family members when I was really young. Then that led to Tintin and Tintin led to comics, which obviously is the medium for better or for worse that I've dedicated my fucking life to. Yeah. (laughs) So it's this bizarre like if I had not come in connection with Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys, life would be very different. I, I would assume. Maybe not. Maybe I would have found comics later, but I would assume it would be very different. Uh, this has been Deep Cuts. I'm Dave Baker. I'm Andrew Sad Boy Price. Please sub the show. You can find me online. That's mine. Oh. Fearless Dave and Oh, yeah, yeah. Sad, Sad Boy, Boy Price. Price. <laughs> Fearless Dave and Sad Boy Price. Uh, if you like the show, please sub it. Um, uh, you can find me online at www.heydavebaker.com you can find my comics like fuck off squad and action hospital there uh old da price where can i find you i've got i've really got nothing really you don't have any social i do but i don't really utilize it for anything okay. you can you can follow me on twitter well at, then maybe at robots in comedy robots 
letter in comedy, but I don't really use it anymore. <laughs> so what you're saying is that uh, if people are interested about you, they should go to www.heydavebaker.com and buy Fuck Off Squad and or Action Hospital? Yes. Perfect. Thanks for listening. Fuck yeah. Deep Cuts is a production by Boy Genius Media. If you'd like to find this show and others like it, please visit boygeniusmedia.com or deepcutspod.com. If you want to join in on post-episode discussions, please join the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. Finally, subscribe to our YouTube channel for additional video content.